go click down here. Okay, okay. okay. left and right so should work, that now. work now. Okay, sorry about that. I also want to say thanks everyone for helping set up the chairs in record time. That was <laughs> a really impressive turnaround. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is sort of the interaction of people, fire, and climate uh, as it might be uh, modulated by human activity, which also affects fuels. And if you look at paleo records of fire, sort of on a large scale, this is data from the Northern Hemisphere that Jen Marlin published. You can see that biomass burning over a long time scale, the last couple thousand years in the Northern Hemisphere. It declines. Uh, this is fire activity on the top of biomass burning. It's uh, somewhat related to temperature and uh, warming temperatures here recently with more fire. Uh, and there's a human population component there potentially as people go up more fire occurs because they are probably uh, the source of ignitions. And if you look at the paleo fire kind of climate work, uh, you know, the, the temperatures and so on become really important. And if you sort of summarize this briefly from 1 to about 1750, uh, fire is being driven by climate predominantly, and then after you uh, uh, consider the period of expansion in the northern hemisphere of people, that it's climate driven, but there's an increase of human influence, predominantly considered to be ignitions, right? People go out and clear fields, agriculture expands, and they use fire as the mechanism to do that clearing. And then at the end here, uh, we see that uh, fire has declined, particularly uh, here in the last 100 or 150 years. And that decrease in biomass burning is occurring despite increasing temperature and coincides with this agriculture and fire suppression management. And it's a human signal, right, uh, is, is driving that. So there's a recognition that both fire and uh, hu human activity and climate interact, but the explanations for something like these increases and decreases may not be quite as simple as sort of a hemispherical scale uh, analysis might take. And so I want to uh, uh, sort of talk about that in a bit more detail. If we scale down to the western U.S. using some of the same sorts of data, you see some of the same trends. You see a little bit more variability in biomass burning uh, and fire frequency as it relates to temperature in particular. You can see there's a fairly tight linkage between low frequency temperature and fire activity. We have people coming onto the scene in terms of uh, uh, Increases in population, uh, increases in fire activity, just like we saw in the whole northern hemisphere. And then we get a decline in fire frequency. Uh, and uh, that's been related to uh, fire management and changes in agricultural practices. And this basically this fire deficit, and which is indicating that there is a potential for the linkages between climate and fire to become unlinked. That, uh, in fact, people can override the climate signal uh, in some cases. This is some work I did uh, with Valerie Truave uh, about eight years ago, and we took some of the tree ring records. So what we're doing now is we're taking a shorter time slice, but a, a more detailed in terms of annual resolution. So we took regions in the western U.S., and we developed long fire records from the uh, NOAA data bank tree ring records. And this is what that record looks like. You can see there's a lot of fire in each of these regions, and we related that to drought and other drivers. And uh, as you'd expect when you look at periods of hundreds of years uh, that climate uh, is important, but it shows that there is some regional differentiation in how climate works in those uh, areas and, and what causes uh, fires to be large. So if we take a look at the regions in the northwest in the upper left-hand corner, the southwest uh, and the lower right, uh, and we look at what, when fires occurred as it relates to drought over that 400 or 500 year period, you can see that in time zero, this is just showing Palmer drought severity index and the years fire occur, that when it's dry it burns. You didn't need to come here to hear that. But that's consistent in that record. Uh, and there's also in the southwest, there's a, a signal related to the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Basically in La Nina years, it's, uh, it burns. And in uh, El Nino years, it's wet, and that wetness three years before provides fuel, which are triggered by the fire, right? So that there are some climate interactions here that also influence uh, how those fires burn, and that's regionally distinct. So what we've done here is we sort of shortened time periods, got into more detail, and we see that different sort of uh, mechanisms can actually create different large fire years. Uh, and if we take a long view of the western U.S. just over that last 400 years, you can see that fire activity dips there in the 1500s into the 1600s. Why? The Little Ice Age. It got cooler overall. You see this reduced fire activity. 
we come out of the, uh, uh, the little ice age and it increases uh, fire activity in all the regions. And this is a regional signal. The linkage between temperature and fire is really strong overall. Uh, and the, uh, if you think about what people are talking about in terms of climate change, we're, temperature is what people are talking about. And, and so it makes sense that we'd be interested in how temperature and fire might in, uh, interact, and then how people might mediate that. So if we sort of summarize some of these findings here, uh, we can, uh, what I'm interested in is that last part of the graph that Marlin was showing in terms of, of people. Uh, that if we look at since 17, 1870, humans have overridden that relationship, right? We, we saw fire drop, we had that fire deficit. That means that climate is actually getting pulled out of the picture in the same way. But depending on, on how people uh, interact, interact with uh, either slowing fire down or influencing climate, you could get people influencing the amount of fire activity through ignitions, or you could actually have act fire activity going up by taking people out. Why? It depends on what those people were doing in the landscape. If you had people in the landscape who were lighting fires all the time, they were keeping fuels low. You take the people out, fuels grow up, and fire activity can increase across the landscape. So how people were using fire in the past could potentially influence those relationships and amplify or buffer that fire climate relationship. So we really need to understand that a little bit better if we're to say, well, if, if it warms, we're going to get more fire or not. Uh, and certainly we know that fire suppression has taken fire out, but depending on what system you're working in, if you, you take fire out, you can get a big increase in fuel or you may not. And that might affect the kind of fires you get. So I want to touch on that a little bit later too. Now I am talking about California in this, and it's important to know a little bit about that. Uh, it's a Mediterranean climate. That means it's wet every winter, fuels can be produced, it's not particularly cold, and it gets dry every summer. So most places in California, in most summers, are dry enough to burn. So that means you have this very flammable environment. Uh, it doesn't get that cold, so a lot of uh, production can occur in the shoulder seasons, in, in April and, and in the fall, so there's lots of fuel to burn. Uh, and it tends to get dry. And there's probably sufficient lightning in most years for a fire to occur, and there's really high interannual variability. Uh, if you think of the, the years 2016 and 17, it was the end of a five-year drought. The snowpack was at something like 30% uh, of normal, and the next year was 174% of normal. And you had one of the biggest fire years you would, that has happened in California in 2017, which was the wettest. That's crazy. It shouldn't happen. The paleo record does not show that. We just finished a modeling that showed that that's never happened in the last 600 years. And that's because the summers are so warm now, it swamped out all that moisture. Uh, and so we have lots of potential ignitions out there. Now, one of the, uh, the, the forest type that I'm going to talk about where the records come from that we can look at fire, climate, human interactions are from these mid-elevation uh, mixed conifer forests, which are a mixture of a Douglas fir, which you have in spades here in Oregon, uh, ponderosa pine, some true firs, and black oak. So we have this mixture of forests, uh, high productivity, fuels, structures, which tend to be pretty flammable. And there's a, uh, a very good record, uh, paleo record, that demonstrates that these areas used to burn pretty frequently every about five to ten years. Uh, and that they burned at low and moderate severity because fuels can't build up very much if it's burning every five to ten years. And if you have questions, just go ahead and ask. I'm, I'm quite uh, happy with that. Um, this is just shows some, a fire scar record from one of these kinds of forest types. You can see that they occur every five or six years. And one of the other things you notice is that there's been nothing here in the last 110, and that's the fire suppression activity, which is remarkably effective given what you know the uh, institutional capacity to put out fires in 1905 was, which was a person on a horse with a gunny sack and a shovel. Pretty impressive, right? They did a great job. Why? Because fires weren't doing much. There wasn't much to do. Pardon? That's California. That's California, yep. Uh, and one of the other things that we know about um, mixed conifer forests is that there is evidence in today's fire records there's evidence in past uh, using paleo fire records that fire uh, has self-limiting behavior in these forests when it was burning under this regime of five to ten years. What does that mean? Well, uh, it means that if a fire occurred here, and you can see it did, that when a fire occurs here, it's going to stop when it hits that because there's no fuel. And that this is a, um, 
And this is a time-limited process, so it'll probably stop the next fire for about 10 years or so. That's what the fire record says, and that's what the satellite data shows with people who are looking at contemporary fire perimeters that basically the boundary for fire spread is probably okay for about 10 years, and then it'll start to move across a previously burned area. So we have a mosaic then, if you think about it, that operated in the past with uh, areas of black, areas that weren't, one fire would burn into another and stop. Uh, if it, there was more fuel there over a period of time, then it would be able to spread. And so probably fires were much more contained by this kind of mosaic uh, situation uh, than it was in the past. And uh, one of one of the things that's pretty evident is, is that people were really important in the creation of that mosaic. Uh, Native, Native American populations in California, there were 35 different tribes, they spoke 35 different languages. They were hunter-gatherers, they didn't develop uh, permanent agriculture, and in that uh, forest type, they were going after acorns, that was a staple of their food. And you can see evidence of the people you know, in terms of grinding stones. This is a picture of Yosemite Valley in 1873. This is all black oak. This is what that place looks like now. How did that happen? Well, we took the fire out that allowed those oaks to stay there. Right? And so they were burning every year to reduce weevils, and there's been experimental burns that demonstrate this unequivocally, that you, know, you burn the litter, it's very flashy and flammable, reduces the number of weevils in the acorns, and the rate of acorn uh, collection is really high right after you burn and it declines after litter falls on it. So people who are really interested in that sort of thing have done work and that they had a really big impact, locally at least, on the kind of vegetation there by uh, putting fire into the system for their specific purposes. And in this system, oaks were a big deal. And um, in California, there was a series of significant socio-ecological shocks that occurred over a very sh short period of time. California was somewhat isolated in, uh, from a lot of the less, rest of the country by large mountains and didn't get settled by Native, uh, Euro-Americans until the 1760s or so when the Spaniards came up the coast and set up the missions. Uh, and so the Native populations were basically intact uh, until about then. Uh, and when they came up, uh, they brought with them disease, uh, they subjugated the people, they tried to turn them into agriculturalists, and there was a massive population decline. And this was uh, documented in ridiculous detail by the missionaries themselves. And so there was documentary records of how many people that were around the missions, who died, what they died of, and they were put in Mexico City, and there was a, a physiologist at UC Berkeley named Sherburn Cook who got interested in this and went down to Mexico City and put together a demography of early California. And so we have pretty decent population estimates over time since 1769 of the, uh, of the Native American population. And so that, that shock happened. We then had the shock of the California gold rush in 1848. Um, gold was found, hooray, come make your fortune. And if you look at the, the estimated migration for that is 4% of the male population between 20 and 40 years of age in the United States went to California in one 12 month period. If that's not a shock, right? Well, what we're looking at is a landscape that's had, you know, depopulation, and then about 120 years later, we had 4% of the U.S. population go there. And uh, they had a significant impact in a couple of different ways. One is they went up into the mountains and started uh, you know, looking for gold. But one of the other pervasive impacts was, and the people who really made the money weren't the gold miners, it was those who were providing provisions to the gold miners, right? <laughs> the, the robber barons, right? They were smart. They sold them food, they sold them clothing. And uh, one of the large scale impacts associated with that was the production of meat for the miners yeah, in terms of sheep grazing. And, um, Sheep were put all over the landscape uh, to provide uh, food for uh, this set of people. And sheep basically eat fuel. So they're fire managers. Uh, and they can uh, change the fuel structure. And then we had the, uh, the 1905 version of a 48 bomber uh, come in in 1905. And this is the original uh, fire managers for the National Forest System. I don't know if you've seen those posters where they have advertisements for rangers that say, you know, you've got to be able to ride a horse and shoot and ride for long periods of time. Uh, they're 
they're pretty outrageous, so I couldn't show it here in mixed company, but they also tell you who shouldn't apply. Um, but they were very effective at putting out fires in a lot of low elevation systems because they'd ride out to the fire, the flame lengths were a foot tall, they'd take out their rake and they'd put it out and they'd go about their business. So there wasn't a fuel profile like we see today to actually make it very difficult. So that, um, and so what I want to do here is talk about this uh, from the standpoint of how people and fuels and climate interact in ways that can both amplify and buffer the relationship between fire and climate. So if we, what is that relationship in detail? And we have these shocks that we can look at as a way to sort of categorize these different relationships. And I would uh, suggest that given how Native Americans in California use the landscape in this system and how they burn, that the depopulation would have led to a, an increase in the fuel structure across the landscape and you'd get an increase in fire activity because we broke up that self-limiting mosaic. And therefore, you'd expect those fire climate relationships to be stronger, right? Because it's going to be driven by climate rather than uh, buffered by, uh, by the fuel. And then uh, that relationship would decline after sheep grazing and Anglo settlement occurred and we put in fire suppression and management. The climate should become less important. And so I want to look at that uh, as a... Uh, uh, interesting set of relationships over those periods of time and then I want to address at the end here this fuel situation that we have developing since we've been putting fires out and that alters a different component of the fire regime that gets at the severity or the intensity component not just how much is burning and there are different components that we need to pay attention to so how did we do this uh, we uh, in terms of the long-term fire record we used uh, dendro uh, ecological approaches and we went out and we found old stumps. Uh, California is much like the Northwest. It was logged out uh, early, uh, beginning in the 1870s or 80s up to the 1920s. Uh, but uh, it's a little drier down there and so you don't get the decomposition. So you could find old stumps, for example, out in the woods that had a remarkable fire record in them still. And so we went out and chainsawed stumps uh, and then uh, polished up the samples. And you can see here the, you know, the fire scars that represent our fire occurrence record. You can even see here, for example, that some of these scars occur within the ring and some occur at the ring boundary. So we can actually uh, get the resolution down to about a six or eight week period in any given year for the last 400 years. If we want to talk about it, I'm not going to talk about it. That's, that's for tree ring weenies, you know, when you get into those details. But you can do it, right? Because you can, you can, you can, you know when the radial growth of the tree is and you, you can sort of go into that detail, but I won't, I won't bore you with that. Uh, and this record uh, we developed for uh, 29 sites across the Sierra Nevada. Uh, you could, and similar sorts of uh, networks have been developed for the Southwest. Uh, there's some places in Eastern Oregon you might be able to do this. So this took 20 years to put this together over a long period of time because no one's going to pay you to go do it at once. <laughs> so you put it together with little projects over time. You just have a vision and don't forget it as you're, as you're doing it. So we're looking here at 2,000 pieces of wood and 19,000 fire scars. That's a lot of time behind a microscope. Uh, but it allowed us to answer a regional question. And so what we needed to do then was come up with a time series of fire activity for the state of California in that system that would go from the furthest time back to the present day. And so what we did is we developed site indices for each location of those 29 sites that had a time series that was related to the number of samples that scarred at that location divided by the number of trees that could record a site. Like if a tree didn't have a first wound, well, it can't record that fire activity. So we had to come up with a way to develop a site index. And then we just added those all together for a regional site index. And, uh, and then we developed a filter that what we thought was an appropriate uh, minimum size to say we actually had a fire. Uh, and then we took the fire records that the Forest Service has. California is, uh, is lucky in having a very uh, detailed uh, geospatially referenced uh, record of fire activity that goes back to 1908. And they, they have it, uh, California Department of uh, Forestry has it. So we were able to add that all up, 
and we simply developed an index from the fire record that went to 1908, and then we glued on an, an area burned index from 1908 to, to 2015. So we had a continuous record of fire for this zone uh, over the last uh, 400 years. Then we related that to drought and temperature as drivers of fire activity, which are, you know, as we've demonstrated, are, are, uh, make sense in terms of fire activity. And then we, uh, we compared that record of fire activity to uh, over time and uh, applied a regime shift analysis to it, which basically looks at a window and determines whether there's been a shift in fire activity or climate based on a, a moving average and a, a variance uh, signal. And uh, in this case, this is the regime shift analysis which was done on fire. It was developed first for looking at, uh, at like salmon activity in, in, in uh, salmon runs in, out of stream in the Pacific Northwest. Rodinoff was the one who developed that. And what we see in the fire record is that there was a shift in fire activity. This is a doubling of fire activity. Uh, and that shift occurred in 1776, and it's not related to when we became a country. <laughs> but it's related to uh, probably the Spanish. There was another shift in 1866, which is just, you know, that period after the, during the gold rush when the, the grazing activity occurred. And then another one in 1904. And so we had a doubling of fire activity, and then a halving of it, and then a, a big decline, a five-fold decrease beginning in 1904, and that's just based on the tree ring record of fire activity. We have no comparable shift in temperature. Okay, so this is a temperature record, Western North American summer temperature anomalies, uh, and these shifts do not correspond to temperature or to, or to drought. And so you, one would expect if, at least on an interannual basis, if there's a big influence of temperature, we would have seen something related to this. What's interesting is when we just take the 1905 to the present record, we do see shifts occurring in the latter part of this record, and uh, particularly this uh, doubling or tripling of fire activity since about the mid-1980s is in that part of the record. So I blew up this part so you could see what's been going on here recently. Uh, what do people think is related to this decline right here? Anybody? World War II, right? We got airplanes to put out fires. And so we're able to put out fires now that we weren't able to before. And then what's happened is temperature and fuels have become so abundant. It's gotten warmer and there's so much fuel that it sort of took away our capacity to put fires out with airplanes. Uh, and that's, I think, certainly you're seeing that in California right now, that we can't really do much. Why? Because the only time fires happen is when it's so hot and so dry and the conditions are so difficult that they're, they're just off and running. But it is interesting that we do see this temperature effect. It's the only one we see in the record, which is during the contemporary time. And if we then break down those, those regimes that before 1776, 1776 to 1866 and so on, and then look at what happens individually when we look at temperature or drought, um, it shows that, for example, uh, the correlation between drought and fire is what you'd expect. Dry years, it burns more, right? That's not a big deal. You knew that when you walked in. But what's interesting is, is during this period of depopulation, that relationship was way stronger than in any other time period, suggesting that drought was able to uh, dry the fuels over larger landscapes, and those fires were running over larger landscapes. And so that supports that idea that removing people and, and the change uh, mosaic associated with that allows those fires to become bigger. And we have a mechanism that does that. And also warmer temperatures. So the fires in each period were occurring with warmer temperatures, which is great. It does work. And that's even the case in the contemporary period. But interestingly, during the recent period, it takes several warm years. The big fires are associated with several warm years in a row. Uh, but they also occur during dryer. So it still uh, makes sense in terms of the short-term record. Um, when we look at the long-term record, you really see that influence of how drought and fuel interact. Okay, here's the regime shift analysis for the fire record. Here's the population decline. So this is the population of California in 1769 based on the mission records. Uh, and this is the, uh, re the, from the census records in 1850 when they first started taking the census, and then 1855, 1860, and so on. This is just for Native Americans. And you can see that they crash you know, significantly during that period as fire activity increases, and then uh, we get the uh, population of California you know, skyrocketing here, and fire 
activity is going down, which is not what you'd necessarily expect. But look at, here, at the correlation between fire and drought on a long-term basis. Drought becomes really, really important. This correlation is about uh, 0.7 which is super high, right? So the relationship between drought and fire becomes super strong when we take the Native American populations out because that mosaic isn't there anymore. And then with the mosaic returns, as the sheep create that mosaic, the relationship declines, uh, and it stays low until fire suppression, and it increases a bit because fuels begin to increase, and then it declines again as we basically mechanize fire activity. So this long-term drought record and fire really resonate well in terms of how you would expect fuels and climate and fire to interact. Now, temperature, as I said, and this is well known if you look at long-term records of fire, is, is a huge driver, and it's a huge driver because it influences the kind of species you get there, uh, and fuel productivity, uh, particularly as you think about coming out of the Little Ice Age in 1600 and it getting warmer. And uh, this is the correlation okay, between uh, uh, fire activity and temperature on a 20-year basis. So I, I took a 20-year period, I calculated the mean fire activity, I calculated the mean temperature, I just correlated them over segments between 1600 and 2000. And what this shows is that uh, that correlation, it's 0.8. Man, you can take that home. Temperature and fire, 0.8, that's, that's the end of the story, right? It's driving fire activity. Uh, and you can see that uh, here with temperature and with the fire curve. They just go hand in hand. And then that correlation de begins to decline here in about 1776. Why? Because we start to have some things happening with people, and then it declines even further here when we get into the grazing period where it becomes unimportant. And there's no correlation after the fire suppression record. So people are really altering that temperature climate interaction. And so it's really a story here of how people are uh, modulating that relationship. And you can see the, this is the expected uh, fire activity. This is the predicted fire index, this is the temperature, and this is what we actually got. And so this is the fire deficit we saw in the charcoal records. This is how much fire we should have had, this is what we actually got. As it's based on sort of this lower frequency temperature record. Alan, what kind yes. of years, where did that end at the bottom? Uh, it ends at uh, 2015. But since it's a, uh, it's a 20 year period, you have to, you know, you have that, long, that one 20 year period, so it stops here, probably about 2000 would be the middle year. So the record went to 2015 that we're starting with. And so if we go back to these original questions, we can see that, yeah, people, these socio-ecological changes did amplify in some cases that fire-climate relationship, but other times they buffer it because it's not important. Climate becomes less important uh, under certain conditions. Uh, and that that's happening through that fire fuels climate interaction. Um, with depopulation, we did get this big increase in area burn. We did get this increase in strength of the fire climate relationships. And you know that mechanism is really was not embedded in sort of what Marlin and the, the paleo charcoal people think about. They're thinking about people as being an agent of ignition, not really depopulation and how that would affect fire activity, which would be in their charcoal record, right? So we have a, a different mechanism here. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make is you can have a signal that's created by different mechanisms. And this is showing that that's, in fact, the case, at least in California. Um, and that basically, with Anglo settlement, we got a decline, particularly during the, the, uh, the fire suppression management and the, the gold rush period. And that makes sense because we decreased fuels and we started to try to put out fire by itself. So that's the sort of story for area burned. Um, what I want to do is spend a few minutes talking about the nature of the kind of fires. Um, because m most people, as the person riding a horse with a gunny sack and a rake, would say, well, it didn't, it was no big deal. Well, the fires we're getting now in California are a big deal. People don't uh, like them because of the kind of fire it is. And that's related to how people influence fuel abundance and fuel type. So that's a different question, right? It's not area burned, but it's area burned of a certain kind of fire. Uh, and I uh, have been fortunate to be monitoring some places in California after the, over the last 90 years, and I'm not that old. Uh, I'm getting there, but I'm not that old. And, and I was fortunate enough to find a bunch of uh, early photographs uh, that was, were taken by a guy named 
named A. E. Wieslander, who was a, uh, a scientist at the Pacific Southwest Range and Experiment Station, whose first job was to document the vegetation of California. What a cool job, right? Most diverse place in, on the planet in terms of vegetation, and his job was to go out and document it. And he documented it in terms of photographs and plot level data. Uh, and I was rummaging through the library uh, and came across these things. And this was in the time where you were allowed to rummage <laughs> and you could take extra copies. So I did. And I'm glad I did because that is not possible anymore. And I took photographs from places that were in national parks and therefore the changes you see in these photographs they're from general land office survey markers I know exactly where they are what direction they're facing and what they're looking at so there's no ambiguity here there's no uncertainty that's kind of fun to be able to say <laughs> so 1923 he took this picture 1993 I took it so that's 70 years right uh, 2010 I went back Wow, look at that. Uh, looks kind of the same. But what happened between these two? Well, a whole bunch of things came up, and a lot of the overstory pines came down. Nothing happened here, right? This is just a national park. What happened was they took fire out. 1905 happened, right? Happened there just like it does here. And this is 2013. What happened? You can only stop it for so long. And the issue here is that this forest structure was developed under a regime of low, high frequency, low severity fires that created a gap and goop structure. All these little seedlings would typically have been thinned or killed every 10 years, and that didn't happen, and there was enough fuel then to create a very intense surface fire and uh, bring it up into the canopy and actually crown fire to kill everything. We have a, now a new situation going on. And then this is a different, come on, here's a, another photograph, same thing, 1923, now, yes? On the previous one, it's just really impressive how much of that wood is still there after the fire. Well, uh, yes, this is only one year after the fire. Yeah. 2012, the fire occurred, I went, I went there and said, oh, i got to go back. Come to California and take a picture. It's hard field work. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Did you see evidence of uh, the big wood burning? Yes, right, this is the same log. Well. And it, it's consumed, oh, I don't know, it's probably... 60% consumed? Okay. Right. Yep. It's still not very much. It's amazing. It's a lot of pitch in there, and uh, you know, there's lots of other stuff to burn. It wasn't dry enough to actually burn out. Here's another example. Uh, 1923 upper left, 1993 upper right. You know, I love these fork trees, right? They, they'll convince you. <laughs> now, the park, based on the research I had been doing there, uh, realized that there was too much vegetation and not enough fire so they actually developed uh, their prescribed burning program so they put a prescribed fire in here in this case it thinned things out uh, and then the wildfire happened and it took the rest of it out uh, but you can see it's not quite as intense because at least there's still needles left on the trees they actually used this prescribed burn to stop this wildfire it burnt up 40% uh, of the park in a stand replacing fire uh, so it did this did help the prescribed fire but it didn't help enough and you can see that basically we have a, again, we had a situation, these trees are two to 300 years old, multiple cohorts, frequent fire system, it's gone. Another picture, uh, same thing, 1923, open park-like stand, ride your horse as fast as you can through it, no problem. 1993, well, we got some dead ones, right? Here's this tree, now dead. It's got a little patch of regeneration coming up, go back in 2010. Uh, that regeneration is higher, this one dies, you know, demography happens, right? And then we get the fire occurring. Well, it didn't kill everything, did it? Well, it, there's not as much fuel. It thins that group of trees we see here, uh, but it, it didn't blow it out. So I don't want you to leave here saying I don't realize there's a lot of heterogeneity out there, right? It had multiple effects. It's not one story, but there's no, no doubt that fuel has increased because we took fire out. Uh, and then that's affecting the kind of fire severity patterns we get. Now, one of the things that's nice about sabbaticals is that you can go do field work. And so I took this last week. This is one of these sites, 1923. Uh, this is 2010. This is 2013. And this is today. Okay. So what we're seeing here is a change in what kind of vegetation is there. Those aren't trees. All right, this is not a range management department. 
so I might need, need to tell you that. Um, this is, again, 1923, 2010, 2013, 2018. Again, no trees, shrubs. Ceanothus, in fact. If you like it, you like it. Uh, 1923. Now, what's interesting about this photograph is it shows some Ceanothus in there, shows some regeneration of the past. What is it saying? Well, it's not all low frequency, low severity. You know, there are places where you get holes. You get some variety there. I'm not trying to say it's one thing, but you do have a lot of old trees, right? You have a, a variety of things, 2010, 2013, 2018, last week. Shrubs. So you have the potential, because you've changed the fuel complex, because of people putting fires out, to have a change in the kind of vegetation you get there. And we're seeing that across the West, um, or in California in particular. I'm not going to go to the West. Uh, and, and what's happening is there's a lot of shrub seeds in the the soil, you get development immediately after that, and it can basically impede tree regeneration. This is a 120-year-old area that burned at high severity in the Sierras, and it supports trees right, as a site, and it's really slowing succession down. Now, right now, this is moving back into forest, but if this had a, normal, a natural fire regime around it, these shrubs are going to go off sometime, and it's going to maintain that shrub component. So because a lot of the fires we're having now are much more severe, it's creating very large brush fields that are going to begin to shift the world to a much more of a shrubby landscape. And we did a little bit of work on this in the footprint of the rim fire, and we're interested in this potential interaction. What happens if the next fire comes, right? What's it going to turn into? And so we asked the question, well, if, if a fire, set of fires burn at low severity, do they maintain that low severity component because uh, it didn't open up the canopy, didn't change the vegetation much, or if that uh, initial burn created a high severity burn and shrubs came in, did it burn again at high severity, which would create sort of a self-reinforcing pattern. Um, and I'm going to, uh, and then we did this in the footprint of the Rim Fire, which is I think now the fifth largest fire in California history because it doesn't include this year. You know, that's going to be the case as, as it goes in California. Um, it was a big one. And we took the severity data from the satellite data for this 1,000 square kilometer fire, and it burned over 21 previous burns. And so we could look at those interactions, uh, the, the fire interactions, with the idea being, you know, do we get the self-reinforcing or self-limiting sort of activity? And uh, so what we're interested in is, you know, if we have this landscape of fire-excluded forests, what are the controls on the severity if a fire comes in? And then, um, if you have birds in it, are those controls different? Is it controlled by the vegetation more than the terrain or, or the weather during that fire? So it's a different set of uh, controls on the, on the fire activity. And uh, we did this using the satellite data. I don't know how many people are familiar with that approach, but they look at uh, basically vegetation cover change right after a fire. They can get an estimate of what it was before and after. The more change, the more severe the fire was. And we just created a statistical model. And since it's all spatially explicit, we can uh, calculate terrain variables or what kind of vegetation was there. And we can look at whether a fire happened there before and whether there's a fuel limitation component. Did it burn less than you'd expect because there was a fire five years before and so on. There's multiple ways that you can sort of do this. Uh, and we ended up just developing a random forest model for this, which predicts burn severity, we can compare it to observed, and we can kind of look at how these different variables uh, uh, influence that outcome. So I'm not going to bore you with the details <laughs> other than that we did it. And this is really, you can just walk away after this, right? Um, this shows that basically when you have a series of fires uh, and the next one comes, they tend to just rubber stamp it. <laughs> so when we had a high severity fire in the past, yep, tends to burn at high severity. If it was low in the past, it tends to burn at low severity. You can see that here. Uh, and so what does that mean in terms of land management or, or forest management and fire? Well, if you want to have low severity patches, you should try to keep your fires at low severity. And if you want high severity patches, well, you, you can get those if you want them. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really an important point, really. Uh, Managing for the conditions you want are really important because you're going to get them again if something comes in in a short period of time, which is a little bit concerning. Um, 
And so this is, uh, these are, this is a, a graph of the controls on that initial burn. If a fire comes in after a long, long period without fire suppression, what are the, the predominant controls? And the first in this case is elevation. So basically, uh, we have really high severity fire in the, the mid-elevation component of that forest. And then the second most important was, was fire type. Well, that's a proxy for weather, because we went back in time far enough that we didn't actually have weather records. But we know that prescribed fire managers, if they want to keep their job, burn during weather conditions, which are going to get very low severity behavior. And the wildfire was really important for creating high severity effects. And then slope aspects, how steep the slopes were. So uh, slopes that were sort of middle steepness were places where you get high severity fire. Then interestingly, time since the last fire. So we had terrain and uh, weather, and then a little bit of time since fire as being the key variables. What is not here? Vegetation for the initial burn. It's being controlled sort of by physical uh, indicators. And this is the observed uh, severity. This is the model. And so, you know, red should correspond to red or yellow to yellow in terms of how good the model is. It's about 50 percent. 6% variance explained, which isn't too bad. Uh, but, you know, you can see basically that we, we tended to hit the, the bright spots and the low spots, and then the middle is a mess, which is kind of how these models tend to work. This is the model for uh, looking at the interaction between that fire as it burned over the other 21 fire, 21s, right? So it's the interaction of the two fires. And what do you see as being the most important variable? Severity of the last fire. So severity of the last fire was important. So uh, you get high severity fire if you had high severity fire before. We saw that in the take-home graph and so on. Elevation is important. And then vegetation type and year since the last fire. And then burning index and terrain becomes uh, important later. So what I'm pointing out here is the controls are really different. One are physical controls on the fire when a fire is burning into a place that hasn't burned for a century. And if a fire is burning into a place where there's been previous fires, it's really related to vegetation uh, and time since last fire, which is a fuel limitation component. So again, that's, in, in many cases, that's related to people, fire management in the past, or whether they had prescribed fire sort of units. Um, and you can even see this back in time if you uh, do work with aerial photographs. The Department of Defense flew most of the western U.S. in 1941. And what I did here is I, I just uh, identified the areas that were shrub fields in 1941 photographs, which we saw are a proxy for where a high severity fire occurred in the past. Uh, here's a map of where those shrub fields were, right? Uh, red means uh, it was a shrub field. These are areas where it was mixed forest and shrub field. Green means forest. And this area burned. This is at the perimeter of a burn. You can see that where the shrub field was burned hot again. Uh, we have mixed and then uh, places where it was low severity. So what we're seeing in this fire occurred was set up, this is 84, this is set up by activity back in the 19th, late 19th century. And so we have this, this landscape memory that keeps getting printed over all the time. And when you had sort of fires that were being controlled by uh, sort of natural processes, you get a very different landscape pattern than where you do today. And this printing press process is going to happen on those in, a, in, in the same way, I think, uh, unless you can sort of change how fire uh, moves and burns across the landscape. So and, and, and looking at this, the initial burning conditions, uh, they're basically terrain and weather. And in places where you've had uh, other activity going on, where you have reburns, that you, you find this self-reinforcing behavior, weather isn't all that important. And that basically, you know, you can do something by reducing fuels or by making sure your fires are low severity if that's what you want, want to keep. I'm not telling people what they should do. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we do or how we let fires burn on the landscape today are going to uh, go down the road and be, uh, be really important for what we see in the future. And with that, I'd be happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Alan. Sure. I love the ending toward uh, the, the ecological memory and, and this word that, that Stephen Pine once dropped in a, in a conversation poem. So the, <laughs> these ideas of layers and layers on old documents giving that, that history of, 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 of understanding of, of landscapes or, or, or stories and how they, how they play out into what we see in the, in the contemporary time. So I'll let you take Yeah, it, sure. Take Please. Yes.
Um, you talked about shrubs um, having like an increased severity. Was there any pattern of where that the shrubs were located? Whether it be like aspects or? Uh, that, that's a that's a great question, and I'll give you two answers. Um, the first answer is those shrubs are everywhere because they live in a soil seed bank. All right, and that's telling us that shrubs were everywhere in the past. But it doesn't mean that they're everywhere in the past in the abundance that we see them in concentrated areas, right? Because you could have a forest with uh, open conditions with some shrubs. That's producing seed that's always going to be there. So if you take all the trees away, you're only going to get shrubs. Uh, we have done a bunch of modeling work where we asked that question. In the past, where would you have expected to find shrub fields? Uh, and we have found that they were likely to occur only in certain topographic positions and be persistent the whole time. And so what I think has happened is, is that shrub, the distribution of shrub fields on a landscape scale went from probably covering about 20% of the landscape being mainly in places where you had chimneys and south facing slopes where recovery would be low and where fire behavior would be severe to places where random high severity fires occur and you would not expect them to be there. So yeah, I, I'm I'm into these shrubs. They're they're a really important part of the story. Um, and we were out in places. I don't want to again lie to you, where we saw a decent number of trees coming up. So it's going to be a complicated thing. It's not an all or nothing, but there are predominant areas where it's all shrubs now. There are places where there's going to be shrubs and trees coming back. Uh, but I think that's where that occurred on the landscape has changed fundamentally over the last hundred years. Yeah. Yes. The shrub dynamics are very sensitive to the animal populations, the grazers. Yep, and right.